Thank you very much. Uh, I left my goggles at home. Um, what I want to talk about um, is what's happening to the world due to changes in the polar regions, which I believe are the main, now the main drivers for climate change, and therefore the place where we must focus our attention if we want to do something about it. So my talk is called A Farewell to Ice, partly because I stole the title from Hemingway, but also because I feel I've been working in the Arctic for more than 40 years, and during that time I've seen enormous changes going on as the, as the Arctic ice has been disappearing. And so it's a farewell to the ice that I knew when I was young. It's a farewell to an entire landscape, an entire what used to be a continent of ice has gone. Uh, but also in doing the research uh, and documenting this for, for the book that I was writing, I also found very strong evidence that the change in uh, the ice extent and that loss of ice is having feedbacks and impacts on every other aspect of the Earth system, um, the, the atmosphere and the ocean, to the extent that we can look upon Arctic ice retreat as now the main, one of the main drivers of climate change. It's not just a curiosity. It's not something we just regret when we say, oh, well, it's gone, another aspect of climate change. It's actually a driver. And coming out of that is, is a, the conclusion that we can't actually map, keep to the uh, Paris Agreement targets of reducing our carbon emissions because effects like those due to Arctic ice changes accelerate global warming, and global warming is therefore going much faster than we imagine if we think that reducing our carbon emissions will get us out of the hole we're in. And so the, um, the moonshot thinking that, that emerges out of that is we need another way to, to save ourselves from the enormously rapid warming that we're being subjected to. And so that's where I, I suggest that our moonshot thinking should lead us to, to, to be trying to take carbon dioxide directly out of the atmosphere and no longer think about just reducing fossil fuel use because we can't do that fast enough. So I'll start with looking at what we thought about when we were, when we were well, when I was young and uh, working in the Arctic. The right-hand picture is the way everybody thought the Arctic was uh, and thought the world was. That is, you've got the Eurasian continent on one side, you've got the North American continent on the other, and they're firmly, indissolubly joined by sea ice which is there in the winter on the right-hand side, and it's also there in the summer, slightly re reduced in area, but still occupying all of the Arctic Ocean basin. So you can think, therefore, of a, a great mass of land and ice in the Northern Hemisphere, which are the two great continents, uh, balancing uh, a hemisphere of sea, which is the Southern Hemisphere. So we're all part of the same continent, really, but we're not any more. Uh, when the ice filled the Arctic Basin, we could do our research there. We free ships into the ice or do put stations on the ice and allow ourselves to drift around the Arctic Ocean, driven by the wind and the currents. Also, if you're working on the ice and you can come, you come straight ashore on, onto the land. This is uh, winter time in northwest Greenland and Inuit hunters returning from a polar bear hunt. You, you just come off the sea ice onto the land ice. Uh, no, nothing in between. But uh, what we were not fully aware of was the fact that the Arctic is warming much faster than any other part of the world, uh, called Arctic amplification. Uh, and if you look at, at how much warming has been uh, in the last half century uh, as a function of latitude, it's much faster in high northern latitudes. In fact, it's about three or four times as fast in the Arctic as anywhere else in the world, including the Antarctic. Now, when that happens, obviously, the uh, Arctic sea ice is warming up very fast, the Arctic atmosphere is warming up very fast, you expect the sea ice to start retreating. 
And it, it looks as if it started retreating in about 1950. The, uh, the brown curve on the bottom there is the summer sea ice extent. The other seasons are the other curves which, where the retreat was not so obvious. But even, even in the uh, summer, it took a while for that to get noticed because although th there seems to have been a steady retreat since 1950, we were very bad at measuring ice um, extent before that time. There were no satellites, uh, no aircraft flights. It was just a few explorers and sealers and whalers. Um, so that, that was guesswork. Until 1950, the area of Arctic sea ice was, was guesswork. But that retreat led us inevitably to the, the beginnings of the ice break getting itself unglued from the land around it. So the bottom right picture there, 2005, was the first year in which the sea ice retreated far enough off the coast to have big slots where you could sail ships through the Northwest Passage or the Northern Sea Route. Then it made another jump downwards in 2007. Some, somebody or something took a huge bite out of the, the, the part of the Arctic Ocean called the Beaufort Sea on the top part there. And um, then the next big bite was in 2012. The yellow line here shows the 2007 ice limit and 2012 was even further back. And then things have hovered a little bit uh, and the, there'll be another jump down shortly, I think. Those jumps down in area took modelers by, computer modelers by surprise. The uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which makes projections about how the world's climate will, will develop, uses a, a suite of computer models, about 13 of them, that's on the, in the little caption there. Um, and the average of those predictions for summer ice extent was, is the black wiggly line. And you can see that it's predicting that there'll still be a lot of ice left at the end of this century. But the reality is the red line, which means it's, it's nearly gone and it'll be gone in the next few years. So something's wrong with our computer models, which is worrying because those are also the computer models used for predicting uh, the rest of the world's climate, like uh, Africa and the monsoons and so on. Um, so something was missing from the models, and the thing that was mostly missing was ice thickness. And you can't just look at the ice shrinking, you've got to look at it getting thinner this way. And we did this, and I've been doing this for many, many years, by going on submarines under the ice and measuring upwards with an echo sounder. So when you look upwards with a simple echo sounder, you get this very nice dramatic picture of the bottom of the ice where you have thin and thick ice that have grown naturally and then these deep ridges driven by the wind. Um, now we use more sophisticated uh, sonars that give us a nice three-dimensional map of the bottom of the ice, the nice pretty pictures which are the same as you get when you map the seabed. Now when you put these two things together, the, the volume and the area, you get a retreat or a reduction in volume which is much faster than just the reduction in area. And in fact, this is the volume of sea ice in the summer um, from the 1970s onwards to, to today or yesterday. And we can see that there's only a quarter as much ice left in the Arctic in summer as there was 30 years ago. That's a really gigantic loss of ice. And what little is left is going to go soon. This can be represented by something called the Arctic death spiral, where you, you look at every month of the year and follow round from the 1970s to today. And uh, if nothing was happening, you'd have concentric circles here. But something is happening all the months of the year, including the winter months, are spiraling in towards the center, which means that summer ice will disappear first, but eventually uh, the ice in every month of the year will disappear. So what does that mean? Already, already we see a difference. Most of the ice now is called first year ice, which just grows because in the summer it nearly all melted. You, you start off from open water, you get thin, boring ice. This is what you used to have in my early life when you had dramatically thick ice called multi-year ice. This was marvelous stuff and a tremendous barrier to 
walking across the Arctic uh, and a real challenge. But now it's, it's like this, flat and boring. This is, this is uh, today's sea ice. And um, that's already having a number of impacts. And these are the things that, that really worry me. Um, and firstly, we're finding that uh, there's, these, are, these are all f f what we call feedback processes that make the, pro that make the changes that are happening worse. Um, that's called positive feedback. <laughs> that is to say, it's negative for, the, negative for our future, but it's called positive feedback. So when, um, when the sea ice retreats, you're replacing white substance, that's snow and ice, by dark substance, which is water, and that reduces what's called the albedo of the planet. That's the amount of solar radiation reflected straight back into space. And there's an albedo feedback effect that as the sea ice retreats, the, the, the albedo of the planet decreases. Also, uh, the snow line is retreating in the Arctic. As the, as the Arctic warms up, you have less snow, and that's an, another albedo effect. You're replacing white snow by dark land. Um, the, the open water in the summer sort of wafts over the Greenland ice cap, and we're finding that the, the Greenland ice sheet is now melting much more rapidly, and that's contributing a bigger amount every year to global sea level rise. And that's a real worry because it's, it's irreversible. We can't easily slow it down or stop it. Then there's another threat that comes from the possibility of a big methane release from the Arctic seabed. And uh, finally, it's not fine, quite, quite finally, but there's, uh, you may have noticed it got cold a couple of weeks ago, and uh, that called the beast from the east. That was actually an extreme weather event, similar to events that they're having in North America, which can be traced back again to Arctic sea ice retreat, although you wouldn't think it was that, due to the ice retreat when it was so cold, but it, it is. And uh, finally, there's changes in the ocean circulation. So I'll go quickly through these. Um, the, the, uh, the albedo change is, was done by analyzing that blue area, which used to be ice covered in summer and now isn't. And their conclusions were that it's equivalent to adding a quarter to the greenhouse gas concentration that we're adding to the planet. So every time you... you, you uh, use a gallon of petrol in, and put out a load of, of our carbon dioxide, that's increased by a quarter because it's causing warming, which is causing sea ice retreat. But that turned out to be an, an underestimate because the, the, the scientists who did that didn't take account of the um, snow line retreat, which is now six million square kilometers. This whole, all this brown area is, uh, land that used to be snow covered in June, uh, and you'd expect it to be snow covered because it's Siberia and Alaska, but it's now snow free. So there's the snow line feedback as well. Put them together and it's like adding a half to, to global warming due to carbon dioxide release. So uh, that, that's a very large feedback. Then Greenland is, is now, used to be like on the left, a little bit of melt around the edges in summer. Now the whole surface melts, and that's putting a lot more fresh water into the ocean. And Greenland is now the main cause of global sea level rise. So the predictions of how much there would be were initially done rather um, uh, complacently by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. They were predicting about 40 centimetres by the end of the century. But now glaciologists feel it's going to be at least a metre, and maybe it might be two metres. And that has enormous implications for uh, protection of coastlines, for the possibility of serious flooding of, especially of poor countries like Bangladesh, which can't afford to raise their flood defences by the same amount as sea level is rising. So there'll be catastrophic effects on, on poor countries and serious costs for rich countries. The other, the methane fear is that because um, there's these wide continental shelves, that's the light blue areas in the Arctic, um, they warm up in the summer now because it, it's ice free, so that big uh, red mark is, is five degrees water. 
That, that warms up and melts the permafrost that sits on the seabed and protects us from a very large amount of methane which is sitting in the sediments underneath. So what we're getting now in the summer are these big releases of methane gas. And we see methane rising. Here's, the, here's some bubbles coming under the ice. And the possibility is there will be a really big boost, uh, a, a big methane release if all that permafrost melts. And that could cause a very sudden warming. Um, finally, uh, um, the, the problem with weather events is this one. This is what we had two weeks ago, that the normal, the blue curve is the normal cycle of temperatures in the Arctic. The red is what actually happened to the Arctic Ocean. It got to be 20 to 30 degrees warmer than it normally is, even though we were very cold. And the way that happens is, because the Arctic is now much warmer in relation to the tropics, the temperature difference between them is less. And that causes the jet stream, which separates these two air masses, to slow down. As it slows down, it, 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 it takes up these great big lobes. And the lo in each lobe, you get warm air, like here you have warm air going up to the Midwest and to Canada, and cold air coming down to northeast northeastern states. Those are called extreme events, and they really affect the mid-northern latitudes. And unfortunately, that's the place where most of our food is grown. So we're very likely to have food crises, not just associated with warming in general, but associated with these extreme events, which we've experienced ourselves. And um, a food price index for the world was drawn up um, a few years ago, and it it goes through these cycles, and every time there's a peak, there's a lot of, uh, it causes a lot of civil unrest in cities in poor countries. Well, I'm going to uh, rush through here and get on to my, um, my main point, which is that the Paris Agreement said that we, we need to reduce our carbon emissions, but we can't reduce them fast enough, or we won't. Um, to, to avoid very serious warming effects because the warming is being accelerated by all these feedback processes. So there are two things we could do. One is to, to try to hold off the warming by methods called geoengineering, where you, you, you do a, a fix. And this is the fix I've been working on, which is injecting um, seawater particles of a particular size through masts into the bottoms of clouds and uh, of marine clouds. And that, seen, that has been calculated to work and that will hold back global warming, but it doesn't do anything about the carbon emissions. So what we need, and, and this is my, my final point, and, and, and the moonshot thinking, is that if we can't get reduced car global warming to an acceptable level by carbon uh, reducing our carbon emissions, which we really can't. We can't, mustn't pretend that we can. And we can't do anything in the long term about carbon dioxide levels just by geoengineering. Then we have to get rid of the carbon dioxide. That's what's causing the greenhouse effect. We can get rid of the carbon dioxide or the excess that we're putting into the, the atmosphere, then we solve the problem. And there are methods that can, will, will pass carbon dioxide over um, absorbent materials turn that into something where the carbon dioxide can be fixed and put, put somewhere where you can get rid of it. There's a pilot plant working in Iceland at the moment where the carbon dioxide is pumped down into rocks where it combines with the rock. So that's what's needed. Uh, and we need a Manhattan Project. So my very last words, I suppose a lot of people have Manhattan Projects that they think need to be done. But in my view, this is the Manhattan Project that needs to be done to save the world, because only by getting rid of carbon dioxide will we be able to stop the greenhouse effect in its tracks. So it's a techno fix, but only that techno fix is unfortunately the only thing that's going to save us. So uh, that's where moonshot thinking comes in. Let's get rid of let's get rid of all our excess carbon dioxide by absorbing it out of the atmosphere, and then then we'll be saved. Thank <laughs> you.